so this evening I'm hoping to take you through my thoughts and ideas um, and my best practice on um, how the brain works and how we can use that knowledge and understanding to um, learn and revise effectively. Now, I've done this face-to-face -face, uh, quite a few times now, and it's got better and better in terms of resources and the way I deliver it. But obviously, um, in the current situation, um, I think it's even more relevant uh, to everybody. Um, but I do want to emphasize that um, I'm never going to use the word exam. Um, I'm going to use the word assessment. There's a whole raft of um, assessment tasks that our youngsters are going to have to sit. But before we um, go into the nitty gritty, I just wanted to offer a personal note, um, particularly to the youngsters here. Um, we have a huge amount of admiration and gratitude for what these youngsters have been through for the last year and two days. Um, I can't speak for other schools, but certainly for Oban High School and Tyree, uh, they really have been quite exceptional. And um, I know there's a lot of chat about lost generations and lost learning and all that sort of stuff. We don't uh, adhere to that view. Um, we think actually a lot of learning has continued for the vast majority of students. They've certainly learned a huge amount of resilience. They'll have some amazing stories to tell their grandchildren, but we owe them. And uh, over the next two months, I know that all my colleagues are gonna bust a gut to help them through the assessment process and make sure that they get um, the SQA awards that they, they deserve. We'll spend uh, about 10 minutes or so. I've used up some of that time already. Um, I want to introduce you to this amazing man, Kipchoge. Um, and I want to introduce you to a particularly good resource that you can access um, at your own heart's content. And whilst I'm going to talk about six strategies, it's actually two fundamental ones that I'm going to focus on. And that will be about um, probably 15 minutes on each. And then we'll just close up. Um, I want to spend a couple of minutes uh, reminding the youngsters that um, there are very important um, instruction words that tell you what you have to do for the particular task to get those two or three marks. Uh, and it's very important that they understand what they mean. And the last thing, of course, is it will be a stressful time. In fact, I've just come away from a staff meeting with some of my colleagues um, looking at the whole assessment process. We're trying to spread it all out um, over the weeks. Oh, somebody else wants to join us. Excuse me. Uh, spread it out over lots of weeks, um, but, but it will be stressful for them. And um, A, we want to give them um, some help to manage this, um, but also to say that, you know, it is OK. Um, you know, being stressed is part of life. It's all about how to manage it, um, how to keep it in control and still allow yourselves to do the best. And hopefully about um, half past seven, we'll uh, go for our tea. So you probably remember um, not that long ago that this extraordinary Kenyan um, broke the two hour marathon um, record. Now, the reason I want to introduce it is that all you youngsters are about to start running a marathon. But it's a mental marathon. It's a marathon in your brain. And I'm hoping that um, in uh, August, there'll be a really lovely text or a nice uh, envelope popping through the post. And it's not going to say one hour, 59 uh, minutes and 40 seconds. It's going to say lots of national fives at such and such a grades. You ran the marathon well. But the point I want to make for this story is that the reason he was so phenomenally successful is all the planning that went in beforehand. And I want to highlight that because I think it's very important for the youngsters to realize that, yes, it's them that's got to run the marathon, but there's a big backup team behind them. So there's just a news item uh, that I want to play uh, to the youngsters just to illustrate what I'm talking about. The Kenyan athlete Eliud Kipchoge has become the first person to run a marathon in under two hours. The 34-year-old covered the 26.2-mile course in one hour, 59 minutes and 40 seconds. However, his time won't be recognised as an official record as it wasn't in open competition and he followed a team of pacemakers. Addy Adedoyan reports. 15 seconds. 
Elliot Kipchoge came to Vienna with his sights set on one thing, running the quickest marathon ever. And from the word go, he was on track and well ahead of pace. The detailed planning was paying off. Special shoes propelled the Kenyan further forward with each pace. They had calculated the optimum course and weather, taking into account his biorhythms and even projected a laser onto the road. But all this means he can't be ratified as a world record by athletics' world's governing body. He's pointing. Come on, he says. As the finish approached, the pacemakers stepped away and Kipchoge strode into history. Into the final 20 seconds, Elliot Kipchoge. Whoa! Got his shoulder, 140, 140, the unofficial time. Oh, his wife. So the um, point of this story, as I say, is that behind this amazing success is... Um, Behind this uh, success, and there's obviously the child, Kipchoge, running the marathon, but there's um, all their peers. Um, one of the big things I want to say about this revision is that youngsters, pupils, you're not on your own. All your pals are going through exactly the same thing, and you need to use each other. So those are the pacemakers all around him. There's teachers. There's a guidance teacher. Um they're the trainers, the dieticians, the physiotherapists and all that sort of stuff. And then, of course, there's your mums and dads, those that look after you, your brothers and sisters and so on and so forth. So it's a huge team effort. But at the end of the day, you can't escape the fact that it's you yourselves that have got to run the marathon and you've got to sit these assessments and so on and so forth. And the key to your success is how well you take on your learning, how you take on your memory. And you'll see from this slide, it's very complex. I'm just going to touch on a few things. What we want to help you with over the next couple of months is what we call your memory strength. And there's two things to do with that. One is how easy it is for you to get the stuff that you need to regurgitate for the exam um, onto paper, or if it's an oral exam, um, into, the, into the oral exam. And the other thing, of course, is that you need to have whatever it is that you need to pass the tests deeply embedded in your brain. It can't just be there loosely and fly off uh, at the time when you really need to remember it. So this slide here, so I won't bother with all the great detail, but it just gets across that idea really, really clearly. And what I'm going to show you this evening is the ways that we can make sure that your learning and your memory is working at its maximum. Now, many of you will have um, experienced these sorts of learning strategies in your classes, either remotely or um, face to face. And mums and dads, you'll recognise these as well. Um, the reason I put this slide up is A, to show you that the things that mums and dads used when they were revising and that still hold firm but more importantly we now know that all of this is based on really solid scientific evidence as to how the brain works and so on and so forth and some of these five techniques um, there are better ways of describing them and there's clearer ways of describing them I'm going to talk about shortly so the website that I'm strongly recommending uh, when you want to spend more time and start to look at this more deeply is something called learningscientist.org. And there are six strategies that we advocate. Um, most of them you'll have experienced in your lessons, but probably not known why the teachers use them. But certainly they're what you need to put into practice over the next two months. So there's something called spaced practice, which I'll deal with very briefly in a minute. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about retrieval practice. That's really, really important. Elaboration we'll touch on very briefly, as with interleaving and concrete examples. The other technique that I want to spend a lot of time looking at is dual coding. And you'll see why I'm concentrating on both these um, in a minute. But just to introduce you uh, to these te uh, techniques, um, Again, uh, the website has got this fantastic uh, set of posters. It's got videos and all sorts. But I've also written a booklet, a study guide. And I will find a way to make sure that you all have an electronic copy of this. Um, so I'll be in contact with all of you. Um, 
and I'll make sure that uh, you've got a copy of this and then you can use it to your heart's content in your bedrooms or wherever that you're revising. And it's got lots of background on helping you to practice these different techniques. So there's plenty of support that I'm going to give you. You don't have to remember everything that I'm chatting about tonight. So these are the six strategies and I'm going to play now um, a quite short video and it's just a really brief um, outline of these six strategies. There we go. Um, the reason that uh, I wanted to show that video was twofold. Um, one is that it re, um, goes over the six strategies and it emphasizes the retrieval practice and the dual coding. But the other thing is that it is a brilliant way of explaining how quickly we start to forget things. So if I was to ask any of you to write down all the things that that guy's been through, I think we'd all have a bit of a heart attack. So space practice, he talks about, um, which is where we need to leave time to forget. Right? There's nothing wrong with forgetting stuff. And talking about the video and how much you actually remember, um, this has been analysed and we call it the forgetting curve. Now, the forgetting curve itself is really quite complicated to understand. So I've adapted one and uh, I just want to talk you through it um, because it, the ideas will resonate with what you've seen in the last sort of uh, four or five minutes. So it's a very complex um, thing to understand, um, but it does explain really clearly how our working memory is turned into long term memory. So when we first learn something, so we've just watched that video, and we're following this green curve here, the amount of stuff that we remember begins to decline straight away. And you can see along the bottom here, there's time. And as time slips by, even just a few minutes while I've been talking, we started to forget stuff. So we're on our way walking to our next class and already we've forgotten the formula for photosynthesis or we've forgotten some history dates or um, some diagram that we've been trying to commit to memory. And time slips along even more and things are even less hazy. And you can see that within quite a short amount of time, what we remember drops significantly. And by the next day, we're below 40% of what we thought we would like to remember. But it's OK, because if we then go back over the work and we start to look at the work for the first repeat, you can immediately see that not only do we remember a lot more, but the amount of forgetting is slightly less. So if we follow the graph through in the logic, we're reviewing our work, we start for, to forget again. But the crucial thing is that that decay of memory forgetfulness is much slower. And after a week, we've actually remembered a little bit more than we thought we could have. And then we have to go back. Remember, this is about space practice. We go back again and we go over the stuff. And you can see, you can follow the pattern now that I've broken the graph into tiny wee bits that by repeated practice by spreading this practice over time and using the different techniques that I'm going to tell you about. So this is just about planning your study, planning your revision. That forgetting curve goes higher and higher and higher up until even by the fourth rep repetition, you've actually remembered much, much more than um, when we started doing this. So that's the science behind it. And that's the forgetting curve. Um, and obviously, one of the big things that you youngsters are going to have to do is to think about um, the time that you've got left and how you're going to plan to do all of these things with all your different subjects and all the topics within those subjects and so on and so forth. So, as I said, of these six, six techniques, we're going to focus on retrieval practice, which is absolutely fundamental, and the dual coding. So I'm just going to let this lady explain in uh, about a minute and a half, I think it is, about what retrieval practice is, and then we'll go through it in a little bit more detail. Close your book and put your notes away. Now, try to write or sketch everything you know about the idea you're trying to learn. 
You won't remember all of it, but that's okay. This will help you get there. When you've exhausted your knowledge, open up the book again. Grab your notes and start to determine what you've missed and what you need to work on more. Bringing information to mind from memory like this is called retrieval practice. To do it properly, you have to put your class materials away. Forcing yourself to bring information to mind is good. When you have your book or your class notes open in front of you, they serve as a sort of crutch. And when you rely on your class materials, you don't learn as much. Practicing retrieval can be hard, but as you continue to practice, it will get easier and you won't need to look at your notes as often. Then, when it comes time to take the exam, it will be easier to remember the information. There are many different ways to practice retrieval. Take any practice test you can get your hands on. If you don't have one, make your own. Or you can try practicing retrieval with a friend. What's a neurotransmitter? Chemicals in the nerves. How do neurons communicate? In the synapse. Why was Freud so obsessed? No, 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 no. I'm not going to answer that one. Just answer questions often and make sure you space out your retrieval practice. Need to learn more about spacing out your studying? Check out our spacing video. You can also use flashcards. When you try to answer a question on the card, that's retrieval practice. It's inexpensive and easy to do. But do try to answer the question from memory. Don't just flip the card. Whatever your method, make sure you put your notes away and bring the information to mind. It's effective. It's backed by science. One more thing. Don't just memorize definitions. Yeah, defining things is important, but what's more important is knowing the main idea of a lesson and how you can apply it. Let's use classical conditioning as an example. If I were to memorize the definition, I would know that. Classical conditioning is a learning process that occurs when two stimuli are repeatedly paired together. A response that is at first elicited by the second stimulus is eventually elicited by the first stimulus alone. But do you really know what that means? Sure, it's a learning process that occurs when two stimuli stop, repeat. Stop. That definition is full of jargon, and reciting it like that, word for word, probably won't help you much on the exam. Instead, try to explain what you think it really means, but in your own words. Maybe try to use a concrete example. Well, Pavlov was studying dogs in his lab, but he started to notice that they were salivating before he even gave them the food. So he started pairing another stimulus, like a bell, with the food, and pretty soon the dogs would salivate when they heard the bell, and that's classical conditioning. The food is the unconditioned stimulus, and salivating is the unconditioned response. This happens naturally. The bell is the conditioned stimulus, and salivating is the conditioned response, and this happens after learning, or classical conditioning. Yes. Now, just before we go on to some examples of how to do this, um, apart from them explaining what retrieval practice is, I think the other very important point they make is that rote learning really isn't of very much use. It's no good just being able to recite the definition of uh, conditioning unless you can actually explain it, and you can't explain it unless you understand it. So memorizing and understanding are two very, very different things, and that's where all these different techniques uh, come into play. So. If we just go through a few examples of what this actually means, the important point you'll have noticed there is that you have to test yourself. All right, It's no good doing this with your books open, with your notes open, and so on and so forth. All right? You've got to close them up and test yourself. And it hurts. It's hard work. Um, it can be frustrating at times when something doesn't stick, but you do have to test yourself. The other thing to remember is that if you're worried about having tests and so on and so forth. There's a lot of resources online. So for example, whatever level you're studying at, the BBC Bite Size uh, for, for the Scottish curriculum has a huge amount of on revision and they have a lot of self-check tests. Uh, some of you will probably buy um, some revision books. But the other fantastic resource is the SQA. So mums and dads, if you sit down with your youngsters and you go onto the SQA website and you look up whatever it is, National 5 Chemistry, all the past papers are very freely available. And not only that, uh, they're electronic versions, but the mark schemes are there as well. So there is a wonderful, wonderful resource for, um, so for example, if it was me or my child and I was looking at a particular topic in chemistry, what I would do is go through all the past papers. I pick out all the questions on a very specific topic like rates of reaction, something like that. Keep testing myself. I'll have already done some um, dual coding, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but you've also got the mark scheme so you can go back and you can check your answer and check that you've uh, learned this stuff accurately. 
Um, flashcards have already been mentioned um, and they demonstrated uh, those. But again, the act of making a, a flashcard already starts to set it in your memory. And then obviously testing them and using them in spaced practice, you'll notice the phrases that I'm using um, is a very, very useful technique. The other lovely thing about flashcards is that you can then space them around the room and you can actually show the different connections between the different ideas because the hardest questions with the most marks are going to be those questions that are testing your higher order thinking, evaluating, analyzing, making connections between different topics and so on and so forth. Those are the real test questions that differentiate the A grades from the B grades. Um, obviously, as I've just said now, you need to go back and you have to check that you have got the answer correct. You can't just fool yourself that you think you've got the answer correct. So make sure you've got mark schemes and obviously you've got a good set of notes. You may well have a textbook. Go back and check that your answer is correct and you've not made any silly mistakes. And as I said earlier on, it is incredibly hard work. You have to be very self-disciplined. You have to do it regularly. You have to map it all out with the different subjects and the different topics. So again, mums and dads could probably be helping their youngsters to actually sit down and start to plan things week by week and day by day and so on. Um, I've just mentioned here about um, you've got to be able to uh, connect big ideas as well as just learning certain things off by rote and certain ways to solve equations and stuff like that. Um, other ideas that you might like to use, um, I've talked about quizzing and the SQA here. We've talked about flashcards here. Um, the brain dump, this is a wonderful thing. This is where you literally try and write down everything you can possibly remember about a specific topic. And then you open up your book again, you open up your notes and you just test yourself and check how much you've actually understood. What that shows is what you haven't remembered. And that's what you should be revising. Don't revise stuff that you already know. Go back, identify the bits where the problems are and put all your focus and attention into that. And then some subjects and we'll look at this um, in terms of dual coding in a minute. Uh, some people call them knowledge organizers or um, mind maps and so on and so forth, they're also very good. And the reason I like this um, uh, image, this sketch note from um, Impact Wales, is that um, some of the youngsters will recognize some of these techniques here that their teachers use. So exit tickets, a lot of teachers use starter quizzes, um, multiple choice, that's the BBC Bite Size has a huge amount of that. Um, but the other thing to remember is that you can do this uh, and set up your own little revision group. So if there's two or three of you doing that five history, I think always think it's quite nice for a group of friends to sit down together, because if you're all in the same boat and you've promised yourselves an hour uh, working together, revising stuff, a you can share the creation of the resources. So you're only doing a third of the work and then you can share it. But also it means that you're all in the same boat together. You're not thinking about your pal that's off down to Costa Coffee and thinking, oh, God, I wish I could be with them or whatever. So you're all sort of come up with a mutual arrangement. And it's great to talk to each other because, to be honest, um, pupils are very, very good teachers. Um, uh, and there's no better way of understanding something uh, uh, um, uh, unless you have to uh, if, if you have to explain it to somebody else because uh, you, you can't explain it to somebody else unless you really understand it yourself. So that's another good trick to use. Um, th this I just put in as reference to remind you that um, there is this learning we scientist website. So if you want to spend some more time looking at examples and stuff, um, just look it up. So that brings us on to the um, second fantastic technique that I want to focus on. And the reason I put this slide up is to remind you that all that I've spoken about tonight is um, evidence based research. So um, there was this amazing chap. Um, Alan Pavlio, uh, who came up with this word dual coding theory. Um, but looking at it um, more carefully, this is somebody's simplified view of um, what dual coding actually means. Um, you can all read it yourselves. I won't insult your intelligence by reading through it. But it's a very clever little sketch note because obviously it illustrates exactly what it is. It's about um, trying to remember something using words and trying to remember something using images and combining them together. And if you look at the next slide, <clears throat> he has shown very clearly how visual stimuli 
and verbal stimuli help us learn and remember and by going through that process of being stimulated visually and verbally eventually the ideas get stuck in your long-term memory and that's what we're trying to get these youngsters uh, brains full of long-term memories um, which they can then recall at the right time when they're doing their assessments over the next couple of months so again uh, our um, learning scientists uh, friends explain this very, very well. So um, last video. Textbooks are often full of visuals, but it's what you do with them that counts. When you use both pictures and words to learn, you're using dual coding as a study strategy. Don't just ignore the pictures while you're reading or look at the pictures and ignore the text. Instead, look at the visuals and compare them directly to the text. What's the same? What's different? What can you learn from one, but not from the other? Next, look at the visuals and explain what they mean in your own words. Then do the opposite. Take some information you're trying to learn and draw some visuals to go along with it. Here are some examples. Here's an infographic. It's really useful for summarizing key information. Diagrams are great for when you need to remember the components of a system. Timelines are an obvious choice for history, but a cartoon strip could be good for remembering a series of events. When you have the information in two formats, words and visuals, it gives you two ways to remember the information later. Once you've studied the information with both visuals and words, work your way up to writing what you know and drawing what you know from memory. This way, you'll be combining the effective strategy of retrieval practice with dual coding. Want to learn more about using retrieval practice? Check out our retrieval practice video. So again, uh, do look at your class materials. Um, Please, you don't have to be a fantastic artist. Um, I know that there are some very skilled youngsters um, who do this on their computer and they just pick out visuals and they use funny little emoticons and all sorts of emojis and so on and so forth. It's irrelevant whether you're a good artist or not. Nobody's going to look at these. It's the actual act of creating and designing them and then using them to test yourself. Uh, that's the crucial part of getting it stuck in your long term memory. Um, Take the information that you're trying to learn and draw visuals to go along with it. Um, so you're, you can see that um, you've got the words um, allied to the um, uh, to the image. And the other thing to remember is that particularly um, for a lot of subjects, a lot of subjects are describing processes. So things like equal signs or does not equal or three lines, one on top of the other mean is the same as or arrows going up and down and so on and so forth. All those different visuals to connect the words and the ideas are also incredibly powerful. Um, and, and they end up as being really quite beautiful works of art. Uh, once you, but you need to practice this and just be brave and get stuck in and um, not be embarrassed about what they look like. So here's a few examples. Um, uh, timelines, uh, obviously incredibly helpful for history, for um, plays. Um, to, to, to get the storyline and so on and so forth, as is cartoon strips. Um, all of these were mentioned, diagrams, obviously. But with diagrams, you see, if I was learning the respiratory system, I, wouldn't, I would have this at the centre. And then obviously I would label the different organs. But then alongside that, I would then start to have the processes that are involved. And I'd start to explain different words like diffusion, um, when we talk about the alveoli here, we would talk about large surface area and I try and get an image of large surface area and so on and so forth. So this is just the very beginnings and this would actually end up as a whole A4 sheet. And then once I'd done a few of these for different organ systems, I could then start to join them together and show that, for example, diffusion happens in all sorts of organ systems and that a large surface area, which is a really fundamental part of biology, is found in a whole range of different organs. So this is why it's such a powerful um, method of revising um, and, and well worth spending time on um, and, and, and helping each other. So this this just goes through uh, the different things. Uh, I've explained them all and um, you're aware of these, uh, as I've just mentioned. Um, again, uh, it was just to reinforce um, uh, the different ways that people do it. Um, you can see here um, 
different people have different names of it but i mean you know even in geography charts and graphs are incredibly helpful um uh, bubble maps um they're incredibly uh, for languages uh, th they can be incredibly useful um flow charts loads of flow charts in science and geography and all those sorts of subjects so um that they can all be adapted and uh, if you go onto the website and want to look at the different techniques then um Obviously, I've, I've given you that link. There's the six, six, six techniques that um, I know that students in the past have found very, very effective. Um, all your teachers have got these resources. Uh, I sent them the links yesterday and a lot of them have used them for several years now. Um, I'll keep reminding them gently. Um, uh, to, 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 to keep using these um, and the other thing of course is that uh, I'm not going anywhere I'm in school very early in the morning I'm always on the yard at the start of the day to meet and greet everybody um, any pupil at any time can grab hold of me specifically and say Mr Champion could you go over this or could you show me an example of that or could you give me a reference for this or uh, whatever I'd love to uh, to explain this one-to-one -one and um, yeah don't, don't feel embarrassed or uh, um, you know, obviously I'm a very busy man and some of the pupils are amazing. Are oh, you too busy, Mr. Chow? I'm never too busy to spend time with pupils and help them through and get the best out of them. So I'd, I'd love to any interaction. And just to finish off, um, it's very, very important um, that when you sit down and you do your assessments, that you have a very, very clear understanding of what each of these verbs mean. So, for example, if it says list, you must list. It'll probably be only one mark. If you then go on to write an essay, then you are spending lots and lots of time not gaining any marks whatsoever. I'm sure the information in that long answer is amazing. But the teachers that are assessing you can only mark the list. However, a list is very different to describe or discuss. Discuss is highly likely that you've got to set out both sides of an argument. And you might even have to draw a conclusion and use uh, some evidence, but you will know how much detail to do that because it'll be worth four marks and not one mark. And describe and discuss is very different to define. Define is one sentence. And again, it'll probably be worth one mark. So these sorts of exam techniques, as I call them, are very, very important. And I'm sure your teachers will go through this. But if you've got these sorts of ideas at the forefront of your mind, then it means that when you come across a word like assess or annotate, annotate, I beg your pardon, you can check with your teacher, have I done this correctly? Is there too much detail? Is there enough detail? Have I got stuff that's irrelevant? And so on and so forth. Um, I think I've got most of the words that you're likely to come across, um, but please, this is something that I really want you to think uh, long and hard about. And when you are doing all your retrieval practice, that you're looking out for these key words um, and you're making sure that um, what you write down matches the mark scheme. Now, as I said earlier on, it's you know quite a stressful uh, time that you're gonna enter. Um, to some degree, stress is quite helpful. So when I'm giving a talk uh, in an assembly or whatever, I'm always a tiny wee bit nervous. Um, and the only times that I've made a complete idiot of myself is when I haven't felt nervous at all and I've been overconfident and just stuffed up completely. So nerves and stress to some degree are quite helpful, but we've got to manage it. And these four things, you'll have heard people talk about this many, many times. Make sure you take nice regular exercise that you feel comfortable with excuse me, make sure that you've got time to relax. And this is very, very important over Easter. I will be the first to say to the, our youngsters, you must, 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 must take some proper relaxing time during the two weeks that we've got for Easter. <clears throat> it's very important to recharge your batteries. And that's without COVID. Uh, that's just an added complication, but it's really important that you take time to switch off. Please make sure you get loads of sleep. Um, one of the big messages that I got from parents in particular, when I did the community feedback during the, this last lockdown, 
uh, with the questionnaires I sent out was so, so many parents were saying that their youngsters were sleeping much better, they had less travel time, um, they had good sleep routines and so on and so forth. And sleep is extremely important. Um, no late night, last minute revision, it just doesn't work, unfortunately. And obviously make sure that you're feeding your brain and you're eating well and drinking well and so on. And then just to round up, um, slightly philosophical, but um, I also think it's important um, to have um, a really good positive frame of mind. Um, again, this was based on some fantastic work done at the University of Philadelphia. Um, I think there's lots of positives that come out of COVID, but one of the things that we've discovered is how phenomenally resilient our youngsters have been. Um, and things like self-regulation and strength of character really shone through. But um, I do think the youngsters that are listening to this um, try and have a self-awareness, try and sort of step outside your brain and just monitor how you're doing <clears throat> when you study best, um, how your relationships are going with your friends and that. When you start to feel a bit stressy, walk away, don't carry on, come back when you're um, calmer and you can really focus. Um, it'll help your mental agility. Keep those strong relationships. Keep talking to mum and dad. Um, they'll be worried about you and um, fretting and so on and so forth, as well as being incredibly supportive. Keep talking with your friends and looking after each other and try and be positive. Um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this, but actually the fact that you don't have to do formal stressful exams um, might actually be a bonus for you. Um, We've looked at the whole assessment process. Uh, we have spread it out as best we can. Uh, you should have had the timetable in Mr. Bain's letter and we'll send it out again. Um, this is a really good chance to do very, very well. Um, and we'll do an absolute best to, to help you. I wish you good night and uh, thank you very much for listening. I really appreciate it. Thank you.